Tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about myself. Um, it seems that there's an a expectation that people want to know something about the president for some reason, uh, which is fine. Uh, I'm very happy doing that. Uh, but I'm also going to talk on some issues which I feel quite um, strongly about. Issues that um, I've thought about and, and, and poured over in preparation for this evening. Um, uh, but they're not necessarily um, the sort of uh, specific issues that... I mean, they will be issues that we'll be addressing as, a, as an institution, but they will be issues that undergird a lot of what we do in our, in our day jobs. Design quality, that balance between uh, value and risk, the, thing that we, the things we're dealing with all the time, our wider responsibilities to the world at large, um, and, and to, indeed, the built environment beyond merely being structural engineers. Um, and the, the fact that we're living in an incredibly rapidly changing world, uh, particularly the digital uh, tools that we we have. So, in the beginning was the world. A beautiful world without structures, nothing made by man. Before mankind learned how to build and, shall we say, before God created structural engineers. It's changed a little bit since then. And over the centuries, the ingenuity of man has created a world in which most of our activities, most of the things we do, the places we live, happen in and around buildings. And with that ingenuity comes great responsibility. It's our responsibility to serve society, to respect the planet, to use our skills well, to the very best of our ability. You all know that, and there's nothing new in that. But it's in thinking about that that, that I have sort of latched onto this, this, this thing about going for gold, highest quality we can possibly imagine, <coughs> highest quality, should I say, we could possibly achieve. I, those of you who know me know that I'm pretty passionate about my structures. And, um, you know, I can get quite excited about, about quality of what we do. Um, it's, it sort of undergirds everything. Um, and, and we need to make the most of it as we, as we shape the world for the sake of, of obviously, the, the people we work for, our clients and the with, um, people who use our structures, but actually more than that, uh, for the whole of society. We have a vital role. And... What I want to try and do this evening is to talk about the broader role of structural engineers, that we need to engage in a wider debate, um, the debate about what we build, where, when, why, and for whom, not just simply the structural aspects, but um, you know, we're, we're highly creative. Engineers are highly creative, innovative, imaginative people, um, and how do we use those characteristics uh, responsibly? So these are some of the thoughts that have been going on. Um, our members are, are involved in a, in a, a very wide spectrum uh, of, of wonderful structural enterprise, um, and we celebrate some of those at our structural awards every year. This was one of the winners um, this last year, just gone. Wonderful structure over in Canada. And the structures are big and small. Uh, they vary enormously. Sometimes um, we celebrate a, a beautiful little piece of structural engineering, structural skill. Uh, by the way, this does have a balustrade. Um, I, I noticed that somebody had written in, uh, there's a sort of comment somewhere, you know, surely how can you award us a, a stair which is so patently unsafe? Um, I think uh, it's clearly because it shows the structure off rather better in those photographs. And I'm just going to be showing a very small selection of some of the winners over recent years. And yes, I have to put one of ours in. But of course, most members, um, most of our members don't achieve the recognition at these awards. Um, you know, and yet their work is no less significant and no less important. They do vital work for the societies they serve. Whatever the scale and majesty or otherwise of, of the, the structures that people build, um, they're all of them uh, ensuring safety. They're all of them ensuring we use our resources responsibly and all of that. And we need to find ways of celebrating those as well. Um, so this year, actually, we are relaunching the Structural Awards um, and there will be new categories the categories which will be, uh, and you'll be hearing about this very shortly, focus more on structural <coughs> characteristics than the type of building, perhaps. Um, and so watch out for that. There'll be, there'll be more news on that. Um, <clears throat> but high quality in design really, really matters, and particularly, uh, I believe, the appearance of what we build. After all, the, we are judged very often by the public um, and indeed by our peers. Um, and the lasting characteristics 
some of the last characters are the appearance and the, the sort of society, the social impact of the stuff that we build. Um, long after these things have been built, um, the clever, cleverness or uh, in, you know, ingenuity of the particular detail or the budget or the program or whatever else it was that made it special um, have been forgotten. But what remains is what it looks like and how it works. So um, uh, although our primary concern has to be for safety and uh, we deal with all the risks and the managing of those risks, um, we also uh, do deal with the appearance of things. And, uh, and appearance, as I say later on, is part of the engineer's domain. It's not just uh, that of the architects. Um, safety, I mentioned, and I'm going to talk more about risk and value and some of the things that the trends which may be affecting the way we do what we do in a little while, uh, because I'm concerned. Um, and um, the digital technologies I mentioned we'll be talking about as well because um, they have radically changed the way we do our work um, and that's having an impact on, on all sorts of uh, areas of our, of our, uh, of our uh, activity. But you know there's an importance of inspiration. Everybody who knows, uh, who, who is an educator, and there are several in the room, knows the importance of inspiring young people. You know when they're making those career choices, deciding what to do with their lives, they're going to be inspired by something or somebody. I don't know what about you, but I, I look back and I just got a, 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 a small selection of, of faces on the screen. Um, but you know, there's any number I could have put up here, alive and dead, uh, inspirational people who, uh, for one reason or another, have, have have sort of come across my conscience, should we say? And, and these are the sorts of people, and indeed some of you are the sort of people who are inspiring the next generation of, of young engineers. And we need to do the very best we can to uh, bring them into the institution. So, yes, who are you inspired by? Who were you inspired by? But perhaps the much more important question is who are you inspiring? And that's all about how we communicate. What do we talk about? How do we put the messages out there about the wonderful, extraordinary work that we do, day in, day out. Because that's how we're going to attract new young blood into this profession. So, something about me and the inspiration that led to me. I think, isn't it true all engineers started with this? I, I mean, you know, I won't, I, won't, I won't do hands up. But I reckon there's probably an awful lot of people who started with Meccano and Lego. Um, but I also had an extremely... Um, practical father. I grew up with a, a father who was wonderfully practical at building things, making things, repairing stuff. You know, whether it be the rabbit cage or the beautiful dog kennel or the unsuccessful tortoise enclosure or whatever it was, um, we did a lot of that stuff. And I'm sure that there's an inspiration in there somewhere of that boy growing up. We made, I remember, a plywood sailing dinghy. This isn't, of course, it. Um, uh, but um, in... in um, in our garage, and, I, and, and that led on to a love of sailing. Uh, and the boat on the left actually was my dad's boat. Uh, we sailed that for many years uh, all around um, the UK and, in fact, Denmark. Um, and uh, I spent an awful lot of time doing that. And I think there was some sort of subliminal learning going on about structures. I believe, and some of you are sail sailors in this room, um, that sailing is a wonderful way of learning um, how structures work. You know, you pull on a rope, you know it's got tension in it. Uh, you know, a mast or a boom has got compression or bending in it. You know, and all of that sort of stuff. And it's, it's kind of subliminal. It's sort of something you pick up. But sailing has changed a bit. I don't know about you, the America's Cup has completely captivated me. And this boat on the right, um, let's go for it, guys. We have a chance of bringing the America's Cup back to the UK. But this is, I get so excited about this because this is engineering technology. And, and it's combined with extraordinary skill. Um, uh, and I don't know if you've watched it. If you haven't watched it, please find uh, a video. There's lots of it online. These boats are extraordinary. And uh, it, that combination of, of engineering and technical uh, and sailing skill uh, is quite extraordinary. And had I not been a structural engineer, I think I might have been a naval architect because I've often wondered about designing boats one day. But anyway, that's another story. Um, okay, small boy, um, chorister at Winchester Cathedral for five years, and actually this had an extraordinary impact on me. Nothing to do with engineering specifically, but I think to do with development of a professional. Because for five years or so, I was in there every day, just about every day, and you have to deliver. Often at very, very short notice, uh, without any kind of complaining. Um, and uh, I think that there was something um, about that. Uh, and learning to sort of communicate and deliver and just be confident. Um, 
I have to say, although I spent five years in there, it wasn't until about 20 years later that I actually finally sort of discovered a Christian faith, which is very much a significant milestone in my life. But um, the cathedral had another, another story which I learned, and it's because I came across this chap. Some of you will know this story, and I'm grateful to Bill Harvey, who's in the, in the room, um, for a, a tweet some uh, month or two ago, because he was visiting and he came across this story again. Um, William Walker is the diver who went down under the foundations of the cathedral in 1911 to stop the thing collapsing. The foundations were on peat, and the whole cathedral, or at least actually the one end of it, was um, in very significant danger of total collapse. But as you will know, if you, uh, if, you, if you want to underpin foundations and you're on peat, the one thing you don't want to do is to dewater the ground. So before you could do that, he had to go down in a diving costume into pits which were dug underneath and shored up with, um, with bags of, of cement. Uh, there he is, uh, doing that. Um, he, he managed to do that. They could then uh, dewater and underpin in the conventional way. Um, but I think something about that story, I remember hearing the story at the age of, I don't know, 10 or 11. Maybe that just had a small impact. Of course, the water's still there. Some of you know that uh, this wonderful sculpture by Anthony Gormley sometimes has his feet wet because the water comes and goes. But that story, um, I think, was a sort of slightly subliminal uh, uh, steer towards... Um, some kind of a, a, a construction or engineering background. So from Winchester, it was to Marlborough College, where music was still a, a, a big thing. I scraped through my A-levels, um, just uh, enough to get into Bristol University. Interestingly, actually, um, had I got those grades today, I don't think I would have got there. <laughs> There's a lesson learned somewhere. Um, but I got to Bristol um, and um, somehow or other uh, managed a, a first-class degree um, where I, at Bristol, I was taught by David Blockley, one of the previous past presidents of, of this institution, uh, sadly not able to come tonight. Um, but he was, a, he was an inspiration. Um, he taught me my structures, or some of them. Um, and he also taught us to um, observe, to open our eyes, to look around us, which is one of the points I want to make a little later on, to actually have an opinion about structural systems when you encounter them. I, I, I think a lot of people walk around with their blinkers on or their eyes shut or something. So he was the one who taught me that. But at Bristol, I had a very really crazy engineering timetable, but it wasn't quite uh, so crazy. It was, enough, it was just enough time for me to do some music, and it's just as well, because that's where I met my musician wife, Rachel, who is here tonight. And perhaps the Clifton Suspension Bridge had also another sort of uh, interest. Uh, it sort of piqued my interest in bridges. Um, and at the time, I didn't have uh, any idea that uh, at one, some years later, I was going to be bidding for and actually winning uh, for our company, the role of the, uh, the engineer who looks after the bridge and advises the, the Clifton Suspension Bridge Trust, a role which we continue to, to do yeah. to this day. Um, and that's a, a great privilege. From Bristol, um, I had an interview, thanks to a referral from um, the professor, um, Roy Seven, with a chap called Tony Flint. Now, many of you will know Tony Flint. Um, this, incidentally, is how we always dress to work. I hope you do. Uh, I know you're all dressed down this evening. I can see that. Um, Tony's name is over there, one of the gold medalists of this institution. But he has been a huge in inspiration, um, and uh, as a, indeed has uh, all of those people, Brian Smith standing beside him, um, uh, and John Evans and, and David McKenzie are both here as well tonight. Sadly, Tony Neal is no longer with us. But with Flint and Neal, I um, had a very, very quick sort of baptism by fire, straight in the deep end, lots of very exciting and challenging stuff uh, technical challenges coming thick and fast um, by, with a, a really inspirational uh, leadership team. This was 1979, and we were getting used to limit state design. Some of you will remember that. Um, codes and standards were evolving very fast, um, so I got involved with some of the calibration exercises to support that work. And in particular, steel bridge technology was changing. Um, uh, we'll come back to the steel bridge collapses in a minute. Um, uh, but we were recovering from those, uh, and new codes were coming, and we were doing a lot of work, and I was in exactly the right place. I found myself in exactly the right place to get, be part of the excitement of that, you say, rebirth, actually. Then I went to Imperial College, where another past president, in fact, two other past presidents, Patrick Dowling and Graham Owens, who is here tonight, um, had a significant impact uh, on me, and I did a structural steel design course. And coming back from that... Um, I was uh, put on my first major bridge project uh, where the, we were engaged in the strengthening of the Seven Crossing. 
and my bit of the job was the bit in the foreground, which is why I always show the, this photograph, because if you look at it from the other end, you can hardly see the Y bridge. Um, <clears throat> the Seven Bridge is the big one, and everybody knows about the Seven Bridge, but nobody remembers the fact this one down here. But that was a hugely significant piece of work for me. It went on for a long time, uh, very, very challenging. We were developing new ways of strengthening steel box girder bridges. Um, and uh, many of you will have heard me uh, talk at length on, on that subject because that also then led on to a number of other similar uh, projects at Erskine Bridge, at Milford Haven again, uh, and uh, Westgate in Australia. And this has been a very significant thread through my career, the steel box girder story. Um, in the 90s, we moved from um, assessment of steel box girders uh, to the independent design check of new ones. Um, and again, some of the people involved with the design of these structures are in the room, which is quite exciting. Um, but these are all in Hong Kong. So the 90s was all about Hong Kong. Uh, you remember it went back to the Chinese in 97. And these bridges were all under construction. Ching Ma at the top left. Um, Kap Shui Mun is uh, the one in the foreground. Does that point of work there? No, it doesn't. Uh, this one might do. Uh, yes, so here's the um, Kap Shui Mun Bridge, Cable Stay Bridge. And any of you who've gone into Hong Kong from the airport um, probably don't know that you um, travel through those structures inside, um, inside the Ching Ma Bridge and inside Kap Shui Mun. Uh, on the MTR train, um, uh, traveling at high speed. Um, and then there's Tin Cow in the background. So that was a huge piece of, piece of work, um, and I learned how to eat with chopsticks. Um, <clears throat> today, however, uh, most of my, my work is in new bridge design, um, and it all started here. I'm delighted that Paul O. Jensen uh, from Dissing and Vitaling Architects is in the audience because he and I um, worked together on this and um, no one was more surprised than I when we won the competition. This was a big competition that was run by the Highways Agency uh, back then and um, really a wonderful thing. Unfortunately, it was never, it was never built um, uh, due to the government cuts that came in that year, 1997. Um, but uh, that has been a watershed moment for, for my career and led on to other projects. Um, I should actually say, um, I'm sorry, the number of the pictures I'm showing, um, I've worked with a number of architects in my time, and four of them are sitting here. Um, uh, three of them are used to be with Wilkinson there, one of them still is, um, uh, and worked on this project. Um, I don't know what the collective term for architects is, but perhaps later on we can take a vote. Um, but we've got a wonderful <laughs> bunch of them here. Um, uh, and they're, they're dear friends, and guys, I'm so glad you were able to make it. Um, but um, so working on some of these projects, which have been a significant part of what I do. Um, but I think probably for me, the pool win, and then um, a few years later, this one, uh, also with Paul Over, um, uh, uh, working for, uh, on the Stonecutters Bridge in Hong Kong. We won the competition, but we didn't win the project. Um, but the project was built. Um, and interestingly, um, many of you will know that I now network for, for COE. The Daniil became COE at the beginning of this year. And um, Chloe were involved in the, in the detailed design, putting this thing together. So that was the sort of story um, of the, uh, the, the, some of the bridges. But there have also been some others, other structures. We did some design checks on, on the Millennium Dome. I always love that photograph because you don't get to see it empty very often. Um, but it takes a long time to walk across that large structure. Uh, so we did the design checks of these. And this one, of course, is the Olympic Stadium. In fact, now in its current um, guys having had the roof uh, changed uh, and we did the erection engineering of that um, which has been a very exciting uh, structure when it changed from the Olympics to the to the West Ham Stadium. And the National Theatre has been um, very key and the story of, of, uh, of my life as well. Uh, still working there. The orange shed is no longer there and that's gone uh, but we continue to work for the National Theatre and have done ever since we did the original engineering before my time back in the 70s. And the bridges, this is a recent one in Copenhagen, have extended from um, the smallest. Um, here in London, some of you will know this, only nine meters long um, and a great favorite, uh, to the longest, uh, not yet built, the Sina Bridge, uh, working with our colleagues in Koei and, of course, uh, the Singer Weitling again. So the story has been um, from uh, Flint and Neal Partnership, where I joined, through to where we are now, so I suppose it goes from black and white and the future, as they say, is orange. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> design quality matters. We all know this. High quality standards must be our benchmark. 
But, you know, this is not, we're not talking about mere compliance with codes. We're not talking about uh, designing to meet a budget or program. Those things are necessary. Those things are important. But they don't on their own deliver quality. The secret lies in a much broader appreciation of what we do, a creative approach uh, to structural design, innovation in structural form, clever use of materials, imaginative ideas for effective and efficient construction, and above all, a sensitivity to those who are going to use and encounter our structures. It's very easy for me to talk about that in the context of bridges, but it's absolutely every bit as relevant in all the structures we do. And that's what I mean by going for gold. Ara had a, had a, a very key solution, a uh, key, key, key sort of quote, many solutions, good and bad and different, the art is by a synthesis of ends and means to arrive at a good solution. This is a creative activity involving imagination, intuition, and deliberate choice. We know, we know that. This is design. But the end of it is, is quality. Two years ago, Tim Eibel, um, at his uh, presidential inauguration, pointed to the list of the gold medalists over there. And he pointed out that creativity was the key to um, the path to excellence. Creativity is, is to be nurtured in all engineers. It's, it's, it's the thing that really you know, is our DNA. Um, and mediocrity is the death of creativity. And those, settled, those chaps, those gold medalists, certainly did not settle for mediocrity. Mediocrity sort of smacks of mere code compliance, and we need creativity and excellence. So um, obviously, sometimes we have projects which give us more scope to do something uh, unusual. Uh, and structural engineers the world over are doing things which are, should we say, less, more run of the mill. That's fine, uh, absolutely essential, completely essential in terms of holding structural structures safe uh, without the opportunity to do something particularly um, visibly different. Um, but when we get the opportunity, we need to do that right. Um, <clears throat> So I have a little kind of, you know, uh, little phrase, um, good enough is not good enough. Uh, because it's so easy to do your design and uh, settle with a solution which satisfies, satisfies the code. You know, you've got the right size of element, you've got the right material grade, or whatever it is, and it, you tick the box, it's fine. But very often you just haven't gone that little extra, extra mile um, and, and done that little bit extra, which makes the difference between good enough and excellent. So good enough is not good enough. And, of course, one aspect of uh, design quality is, is the appearance. And we go back to bridges again for a minute. Um, some of you will remember this. This is back in the 19s again. Uh, I was involved uh, with this uh, Royal Fan Art Commission seminar uh, on bridge design. And it, it, it started because of a general malaise, a general concern about the quality of the built stuff that we were seeing around us. Um, and in fact led on to, uh, and in fact actually what was, what was sort of one of the triggers was the black and white photograph in the background. Some of you will recognise this Carla Travis uh, proposal for the East London River Crossing uh, and, and it was because I was working with him on that that I got involved in this. Um, <clears throat> and that led on to the appearance of Bridges document which the Highways Agency produced and I don't know that very many people use it, frankly. But very interestingly, um, uh, uh, before Christmas, back in October, end of October, I was at an event where I heard John Hayes, who's the MP Minister of State for Transport, say this. I'm not going to read it. I'll leave you to read it yourself while I have a drink of water. And, you know, actually, I was completely stunned um, hearing a minister saying, you know, we've got to do better on the appearance of our structures. It, he went on. Design. So many areas of design. Ugliness and destruction remain rampant, unchallenged by those with the power to prevent it. I mean, you know, this is, this is really significant stuff. And to hear this from a Minister of Transport, I wanted to shout from the back and say, hallelujah. As it happens, at the end, I did go up to him and I chatted to him. Um, and I talked, uh, pointed out, uh, reminded him about the Royal Fine Art Commission seminar and the Pool Harbour Bridge competition, which also came out of that. Uh, it was all the same sort of time. The Highways Agency ran that competition specifically because that was happening. Um, and we need, and it says there, ours can be and must be an age in which the aesthetic quality of the public realm soars. Guys, we've got work to do. And my point actually is that, um, you know, as engineers, uh, we are every bit as responsible as um, the architects. So very often architects take the credit, credit or blame for, uh, you know, good-looking good or ugly structures or buildings. 
Uh, and fine, maybe sometimes that's, that's absolutely right. Uh, but we also have our role to play. Vitruvius is a pretty good place to start. Some of you will know Vitruvius. Um, he wrote the 10 books of architecture a long time ago. Um, utilitas, firmitas, venustas, you all know what that means. Um, the function, utility, the top one. Strength and stability, firmitas, sort of making sure it doesn't fall down and it works and all that sort of stuff. And venustas, elegance, delight, it's the appearance side of things. And he pointed out that these three things all need to be satisfied. And I put it to you that we spend most, nearly all, maybe sometimes it is all of our time, looking at the first two. And in, in my case, certainly, my university education was entirely on all that stuff. Safety, economy, buildability, durability, maintainability, sustainability, code compliance, all that stuff is those two. And what about this stuff? The elegance and delight, the scale and proportion. Who is learning about this? Shape, form, clarity, legibility, light, shade, and a whole lot more. Um, uh, the word elegance has different meanings for different people, but in the context of structures and buildings, I wonder whether some of this, certainly in the context of bridges, these words are some of the words that sprang to my mind when I was thinking about elegance. And, you know, it's, it's, as designers, we've got to be thinking about this stuff at the beginning of the conceptual design process. It's not something you think about, oh, I've done my structural, my, my stability, I've done my safety, I've done my, you know, sustainability stuff, uh, but let's think about what it's going to look like. No, it's got to come right from the beginning. Um, and these, of course, are some of the uh, characteristics of elegant structures. I'm not going to go through all of them, but you can get, I think you can get the, the idea. One of them that I'm particularly keen on on that list is timelessness. Because sometimes you see structures being built which are, frankly, you know, they're fashionable, they may be clever, but are they going to still be um, elegant? Or, you know, even if they are now, are they still going to be good in 100 years' time? Um, there are some ugly ones, and I won't fall uh, on those, but I, 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 I would love to point out the one at the top left. Um, and the, the engineers among you, which is most of you, uh, would ask what on earth that thing is doing uh, on the top of the bridge. Um, and the one most of you have driven under uh, probably 100 times, uh, which uh, some years ago got the accolade as the ugliest bridge in, in, uh, in the UK or England or something, but then pole, the one here on the top right. But let's not dwell on those. Let's look at some slightly more inspiring ones. Um, for some of the greatest designers, um, Maya, top left, um, Michel Villager, and I'm mentioning the engineer deliberately, as you might imagine, for Mia, uh, Sonneberg is Christian Men, um, and Gateshead Millennium, um, in the days when it was Gifford, now Ramble, of course, uh, architects again in the room. Um, but engineering elegance, and this is a point I really want to stress, is not just about appearance. And this is where we come back to the broader picture. Vitruvius is all three. Because the, en the elegant solution to a problem, rather like uh, a mathematician might talk about an elegant solution to a mathematical um, challenge, an engineer can find that too. The solution that just captures everything in one very, um, uh, very, very good uh, system. The Avilodrome, of course, is a wonderful example. Um, and it, it's going to embrace all of these things, the appropriate form, function, balance, and all those things. Um, uh, and there's a lovely quote from Bill Addis, who, who just sort of captures it somehow. Engineering elegance implies achieving a minimalist solution, one which is strikingly simple, or one particularly easy to build, or which satisfies several design constraints at the same time, rather than only one. Mies van der Rohe was even more succinct when he says, God is in the details, because the details matter. I love this, this, this slide. I'm grateful to James O'Callaghan, who's here, uh, for this slide, because it shows the evolution of the details in the fixings of a glass staircase from the, the left to the right, going from the point where you know, the detail was uh, expressed on the outside, still very beautifully done, but to the minimalist solution where it's all uh, contained within the glass. Beautiful transition where it's not only elegant to look at, but it's also a wonderfully elegant technical solution. That's what I mean by the elegant solution. And I think we've got four focus areas that we need just to think a little bit, a bit about uh, as, we, as we think about all these things. And I certainly would like to put these to you uh, as educators, as practitioners, as trainers of young, of young self. Precedent. Let's look at precedent, at what's gone before. A student of music would not consider doing their studies without looking at the work of Bach, Mozart, Britain, whoever. Architects would look at, you know, who, whoever it is, Le Corbusier or, 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 you know, some of the other great architects, Palladio or somebody. So, 
you know, and we must look at, at the great architects, the great engineers of the past, and learn from them. Maya Freisene, Candela, Torocha, Schleich, all these people, some of the inspiring people I put up earlier on. Let's learn from those guys, find out what works well. And that's the next word, appreciation. Really learn to appreciate. This is what David Blockley taught me, to have an opinion on what is good and what's bad. I think, you know, to learn, to, I, I sometimes feel some people go through their life, the life just not looking around them and not appreciating uh, the difference between, you know, what makes uh, the difference between mediocrity and, and excellence. Criticism. This is something which the architects do really well. They criticise each other's work. They, you know, you learn from each other. The peer review. I don't know that there are very many engineering offices that do it. We could certainly do it better. And, and learning from your peers and allowing, subjecting yourself to constructive criticism uh, is, is one of the most important ways that we can improve what we do. And, of course, education. We need to educate um, all these things, uh, not just the structural behaviour and the systems, but also the venustas part of the, uh, the, the uh, equation. Okay, moving on to risk and value. How are we doing? We're doing fine. Um, <clears throat> I, th this, is, this is an area where um, we certainly need to concentrate because this is absolutely the realm of the structural engineer. Um, we all know what we're trying to avoid. These are the sorts of disasters that, um, that do happen, sadly. And this institution publishes some world-class authoritative guidance on, on some of these things to avoid things like temporary structures and collapse and so on. Um, these are, are critical. Of course, there's also the, the natural disasters that happen. Um, and, you know, these are the things that we're here to, to avoid and, and uh, understand the risks and design them out as far as we can. And I believe, uh, the early part of my career, as I early, earlier said, I spent a lot of time checking designs, particularly those Hong Kong designs, for example. And, and, and I think this is a really important discipline for any engineer wanting to go into design, to un understand you know, what, how, how the design comes together, learning from doing checking. Uh, and design checking for a bridge engineer is, is, is normal. Um, people, it's quite a, a familiar and established principle. But it wasn't always the case. And this is where I'm going to refer to the tragedies of the early 1970s. You all know these stories. So if you don't, you need to know them. Um, because the sad thing is that people forget if they ever knew. These collapses um, occurred in very short time, as you can see. And all of a sudden, um, there were some serious questions being asked about steel box girder behavior. In Melbourne... Westgate Bridge collapsed, killing 35 people. It still remains to this day Australia's most uh, significant natural, uh, uh, engineering disaster collapse. <laughs> Immediately after um, these, well, in fact, after the Milford Haven uh, collapse, um, there were some very, very significant work, some very significant work done. In about three years, um, you know, it has been said that about 30 years' worth of research uh, was done to understand the behaviour of these structures and. The, um, the inquiry, uh, the Merrison Committee of Inquiry, produced their recommendations in 1973. Those dog-eared documents on the right-hand side of my copies of the interim design and workshop rules, I haven't actually looked at them, I have to confess, for a few years now. But they used to be, and indeed are in our office for many still are, uh, a Bible, because they uh, properly represent, represent the behaviour of these structures. Um, but I, uh, apart from the fact that the, the Merrison Committee did an extraordinary work uh, and, of course, Dr. Flint was, was part of that, which is why we found ourselves very much involved in all of that. Um, the most important thing here is, uh, I think, uh, the lessons for us, is the recommendations. <coughs> the engineer's permanent design should be checked by an independent engineer, both for the design concept and the method of analysis and stress, and a certificate furnished to this effect. The independent engineer should have experience and qualifications commensurate with the magnitude and complexity of the design in question. So that's an independent check. We're not talking about a quality assurance check here. We're not talking about somebody looking at the calculations and looking as though they've, they've done it right. This is a completely independent analysis, and many of you in the room know that. That was the first recommendation of the Marison Committee following those collapses in which people died. And the second recommendation was that the, desi the designer, in this case called the engineer, because in those days, if you remember who was a capital E engineer, should be responsible for the supervision of the works. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm finding that this is being forgotten. 
Um, and with modern procurement routes, uh, clients are finding ways to avoid these things. They see it as unnecessary expense. We've got a job on right now, I won't tell you what it is, where the client refuses to pay for an independent check, which we've recommended. Now, it's not, it's not because we can't, we're not confident in our design, but it's because we believe that, you know, in the, with the best will in the world, mistakes do happen, or we don't quite see the things that somebody else might see and a second pair of eyes for a fraction of the cost of the construction of this bridge will be worth doing. And the danger is that people, as I say, have forgotten, and I have to tell you that I worry quite seriously that as a profession, things are going in the wrong direction. Now, you know, we need to recognize that, that uh, um, we, you know, we, we, need, we need those checks, uh, and I believe it's very uh, you know, short-sighted not to have them. But, you know, we have a dilemma too, don't we? Um, you know, we want to encourage that creativity, that innovation, that imagination. Um, and, you know, these are the lifeblood of, of any good engineer. They're the, the way we, 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 we produce good quality. And because that's what society needs. <coughs> uh, more innovation requires more checking. If you're going to do something new, you need to be sure of it. That means you check your own work and it's not a bad idea for somebody else to check it too. So, you know, if you want to minimize the uncertainty and reduce risk, you need to do the checking. And such was the lesson of the early 1970s in the case of steel box girders. Um, when you do something new, you need to be extra sure. It stands to reason. And being extra sure means we need to be particularly careful. So, as I say, this is not blind dependency on QA processes or code compliance, because if we just rely on those, that's an extremely dangerous position to be taking. Now, I have to say the institution is very active here because, um, you know, we do uh, look at, at the risks and we publish a lot of documents and we help our members to manage risks every day. Uh, that's what engineers do. Engineers manage risks. That's what we're in business to do. Um, and we have a duty to inform our clients of those risks. So I'm hoping that, you know, through this year, I shall be talking about this a lot um, and, and uh, seeing how, uh, you know, what can we be doing and what should we be doing. Uh, in, the, in the way in which we do structures. Not just bridges, but all structures. I, I want, the other thing that's worrying me slightly here is that um, some of the procurement processes are putting a lot of pressure on program. I just uh, I put this up very, very, very quickly. I sort of did this very quickly the other day uh, because I wanted to sort of talk about design at the left-hand end of the, of the spectrum when you start with an idea and you end up at the right-hand end of the spectrum building it. You want to move, you need to know that you move from a position of uncertainty, you're starting with something new, to a position of confidence. You, nobody wants to start building something if they're not really sure about it. And so the stuff that the engineers are doing is all this stuff on the bottom. You start at the left-hand end with inspiration and creativity and innovation and imagination and all that stuff. And then you have to go through all the verification and development and the checking and the testing. And we've got words like optimization in there. And all that takes time. And you get to certification and specification and finally to implementation. And if you're properly appointed, as the recommendation said, you would be doing the supervision as well. But unfortunately, we find, and I don't know about whether you empathize with this or you, uh, your experience echoes this, we find that our pre-construction design time is getting shorter and shorter. Often. I won't say it's always, but often. And perhaps particularly in a design and construct context, which is often. And what does that do? That means that we have less and less time to do all these things. And some of them, perhaps, just don't get the, the, the uh, emphasis that they deserve. We're still trying to reduce the risk, but we've got less time for it. And if you combine, and so everything gets compressed, and you know, you know what, that hap what happens there. And if you combine this lack of time with, I think, probably what many of us can hold our hands up to say, that we often find teams working long hours, and we're working tired, it's a disaster waiting to happen. I'm sorry to sound so bleak about it, but I think that we need to be very concerned and alert to these issues. And, and I hope to, um, to, to instigate a review, which would need to be cross-professional, of course. It would need to be discussing with other um, professional bodies. It's not something we can do on our own. But a review of uh, procurement processes and, and the systems that we have in place. Uh, and I will be discussing this with our, my colleagues here uh, to see how we can how we can do that. 
And then on to our wider responsibilities. Um, I mentioned earlier at the beginning that uh, we need to be repair, uh, re aware of our wider responsibilities to society, which go beyond those of, of just uh, to our clients and to our, our uh, colleagues and so on, immediate project team. We are built environment professionals. Our work affects the built environment. You know, everything you see outside, everything you see out there that's built is, has, you know, has got some kind of uh, responsibility making that thing safe and making it what it is. Not always, of course, structural engineers. Uh, domestic scale housing, of course, very often without. And I have certainly, in an earlier part of my career, have had to deal with the, 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 the problems of when school buildings have been built shoddily uh, without engineering input uh, and people have died. So, wider responsibility um, to society as a whole. So, we, you know, this is Wong Kok in, in, in Hong Kong. Um, what are we building? You know, what kind of society is that? Um, would we prefer to live there or would we prefer to live in Amsterdam? I mean, it's a very extreme example. Um, uh, but, you know, um, these are very different societies and, and we should have a view and a voice on these things. Um, some of you will know that in New York recently, Times Square has been somewhat transformed. This actually, this actually was a, an image from the kind of trial period which was done a year or two ago. But I believe, uh, and I think, I'm um, not sure whether Mike Cook's in the room, but um, I believe that Gura Hapold has had something to do with the transformation. Turning it from a place which is totally dominated and ruled by the car or the lorry or the vehicle to a place which is a human-centered, uh, much more friendly environment. Now, you can't do that everywhere, of course. But we, as engineers, need to get involved in these kind of debates because we're built environment professionals. There may not be that many structures, although the umbrellas are structures. <laughs> there may not be that many structures in, in, in this, but there's still a role to play as built environment professionals. And um, you know, what is our position in terms of achieving zero carbon housing? Many of you will know that that is now the government policy. Any, any development of 10 homes or more now need to be zero carbon. What does that mean? That actually means that the CO2 emissions from regulated energy use, that's you know, heating, hot water, lighting, and so on, um, reduced to zero. Now, you, you know, if, you, if you don't do it, then the developer has to pay a, pay a, a, a fine. That's, that's the rule. Okay? And that's coming, and it's going to get more. And most argue that this actually is virtually impossible in a big city. Uh, you know, where do you put the solar panels? Because if you're building a very, very tall building with lots of people in it, you know, you, there isn't enough room on the roof. And, of course, um, uh, the, sp the space is uh, you're competing with, uh, with photovoltaics and so on. Um, now, this is not a new problem. Um, and, of course, the architects and, and, and others have been struggling with, with these issues. And, again, here we are. We're professionals uh, working in that environment. Uh, we need to be having a say because this is where we earn our bread and butter. I rather like that image, don't you? Um, but, you know, it seems that you can't have both high density and zero carbon. At least I'd like to know how, um, if we can get to livable cities. And, of course, a lot of people are now spending a lot of time talking about how we can make our cities more, vis more livable. Um, and we can get engaged in that. <clears throat> so, you know, we've seen this rapid um, urbanization. 50%, roughly, of the population now live in cities. Uh, or, in fact, I think it's not quite that yet, but it's getting there. Um, but maybe, just maybe, these kinds of things, the, 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 the low energy agenda is going to reverse the trend to you know, very large, dense, tall uh, construction. And that, of course, is going to affect our work. So, um, you know, if our cities change, perhaps towards a more human scaled and friendly environment, then maybe the types of structures we're called on to design will change. Uh, and we must have a word in that debate. And what about the developing world? Um, <clears throat> we have a responsibility, I believe, to the whole of society, not necessarily just to those um, who uh, you know, pay our bills and so on. Um, I'm delighted that uh, we're seeing increasingly um, involvement uh, with uh, humanitarian work. This, of course, is from our up another one of the winnings, uh, structural award winners, actually. This is from a year, a year ago or so. Um, and you know, I, I, I love the fact that we're getting involved with that and I want to encourage more and more of us to, to do that. And I believe that, you know, for at least some of the time, we should put effort into, into this kind of work to, to help out those who need our help. You know, I'm referring to those many millions 
um, who lack even the most basic of, of facilities that we all take for granted. Um, and, you know, there are there's a, a endless stories, and I, and I, I won't, I uh, promise, uh, go on, but I certainly could, um, about some of these issues. Uh, but whether it be housing, um, you know, displacement, migration, natural disaster, civil conflict. You know, civil conflict is an interesting one. You know, who owns the rubble? You know, these are some of the issues that people end up discussing. But, but you know, again, our members are engaged, and I'm delighted to say that um, last year we joined, uh, helped to, to, to establish, I should say, um, the UK Built Environment Advisory Group, which goes under the rather um, uh, difficult um, mnemonic of UKBEAG. Um, but uh, there it is. Um, the, Rob, the RIBA, the RTPI, and ourselves established this. And this is basically recognizing that between us, we have members all around the world able to respond to these sorts of scenarios. Um, our membership, of course, 27,000 members or so, distributed around the world. Um, the other institutions... Uh, with more and distributed differently, but by working together, we can come together with a, with a, 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 a coordinated approach to helping these, um, these situations. And I'm delighted that the, panel, that the institution has just established a new panel to be working under the Engineering Leadership Group um, the, to look into international development and humanitarian issues, um, and we'll be engaging with these sorts of things. Um, so uh, look out for that, because uh, we're finally... Um, have a, a role which is specifically targeted looking at those sorts of things. And of course we deal with codes and standards, you know, building codes and construction standards. You know, this is the, the one on the left, you know, remember Bangladesh, um, and the one on the right, I mean, you know, you do occasionally see extraordinary things inside reinforced concrete. Um, and it's hardly any surprise that sometimes they fall down. Um, and of course, my, in my world, um, uh, the world of bridges, um, there's, um, you know, there, there, there's things that, that need to be done as well. About a, a billion people, that's about a seventh of the planet, um, a billion people live uh, without access to basic facilities, education, medical care, markets. Um, at least they live without access uh, where, when they can get there easily because there's a river in the way and to get to it, they've got to go an awfully long way around. Um, and I'm delighted that, um, that uh, Bridges to Prosperity is one of many charities, actually, that works with this, um, and I've become involved with it, um, and, you know, dealing with, with these sorts of situations. The picture on the left, incidentally, that's an ambulance. The guy is taking, the person who's sitting down on that little raft is being taken to hospital. I don't know how long he was going to take to get there. Um, the boy on the right, um, sorry, it's such a bad photograph, but... Um, uh, would you cross that? It occurred to me, looking at this picture, actually, I've never really analysed it before, but I imagine he has to take that vertical string with him because otherwise the deflection of the lower string would mean that he would no longer be able to hold on to the top string. So as he crosses this raging torrent, he has to pull that string with him. Um, so Bridges Prosperity is one of many, um, and again, our members are getting involved um, with, with this. In fact, there are some in the room who are about to go to uh, one of these projects um, and others who come back from them. Uh, and, uh, and again, you know, what I believe is that we have a hugely significant role to play in changing the, the conditions, changing the life story uh, of so many millions of people. And we have a duty to do so. Um, you don't have to have a client paying you to do so. So um, uh, we have a hugely significant role in advising planners and local authorities on, in earthquakes, zones, strong wind zones, um, flood, fire prone areas, you, know, you name it, um, and we do it. And I'm delighted that this institution is so active in those areas. Um, and I'm, uh, you know, just wonderful to, to see that. And, and I'm certainly one who's going to want to engage uh, more with that sort of thing. Finally, and more briefly, um, you'll be glad to know, digital stuff. I say briefly because actually I, I begin to get out of my depth here, because I am of a certain age, you understand. Um, BIM, okay, we know about BIM. Um, we really don't need to talk about BIM. It's, been, it's with us. We, we do it. Most people do it. Um, and it's, um, but, you know, uh, some of the tools that we're using nowadays would be, have been unthinkable even just a few years ago. Um, and the pace of change shows absolutely no sign of letting up. Um, many of you will know what that is. Uh, those of you who don't, um, it's um, a parametric structure definition in a program called Grasshopper. Uh, I, came across, I came across Grasshopper 
a few years ago, um, and it's an extremely powerful tool. Many of you have been using it uh, for some time. Um, and what this enables us to do is to um, do things in a much more seamless digital way. Because um, at the one end, you've got the conceptual design, you can have some ideas, you can set up some parameters which you allow you to change things. And they automatically then change things further downstream where you're doing your structural analysis. You may even be producing drawings in a pretty seamless process. In fact, these days, less and less do we produce drawings. It almost certainly goes and certainly will be going straight to the constructor or the fabricator, the maker, so in a seamless digital process. Now, that immediately says something to us about how we need to check our designs. Virtual reality is something which um, uh, you know, is here. Many people are using it. Um, the, the, I'll just talk over this one, if this is going to work, which I hope it will. There it goes. Um, so, you know, we have, we have the facility to model in 3D. We have the facility to have conversations with people across the other side of the planet in the same room. In other words, they're also looking at this same thing and pointing at it and discussing it. Um, and, and these are some of the things that are happening now. Um, I'm, I'm delighted, again, the institution has grasped the nettle um, and we've established a new panel specifically to look at these kinds of things. Um, in the digital transformations, the, sorry, the digital um, changes that we are doing uh, and are coming to terms with. So as to be able to advise our members. Clearly not all our members have got the big budgets and the big skills and resources that the larger firms have who are doing this. Um, but, and, and, and I can completely understand that some of the smaller practitioners working from home or working in a small office doing domestic scale stuff have no use for this. Yet. And I say yet because the pace of change is fast and I would not be at all surprised if we don't find that, I don't know, five, ten years down the line, just about everything is done in this sort of way because that's the way things are going. I mean, how many of us predicted the ways the mobile phone works now and the information you can get off your phone 10 years ago? So, you know, this is coming and the institution has set up a panel specifically to address uh, some of those things. Make sure that we can keep abreast of the developments, advise our members on what needs to be done. Of course, what it also does, is it raises some questions in our mind about the nature of the people that we employ in our design offices, because what we're finding is we're bringing in people with different skills. We've got people with digital um, computational skills, which we didn't use a few years ago. And so the institution has recognized this and is saying to ourselves, do we need to make any changes to our, our membership structure? Do we need to have a new kind of class of member? Do we need to change our exam? Do we need to, to do anything which, which would allow these kinds of skills? Or do we need to test these skills in some way? Because in the reality of the day-to-day -day design office, these are the skills that people are using. As I'm speaking, I'm looking at some people in the room from my office, and I know they're using this stuff. So, um, but, you know, it's not tested at the moment. So that's something which we are alert, alert to, and we will be um, uh, reviewing what do we need to do uh, in our processes. And of course, it's not just 3D design, it's 3D making that stuff. Some of you will have seen this at the V&A. This is a 3D robotically built structure. It's a canopy. Um, I didn't get a photograph of the robot. It was actually sitting over in the side there. Um, but uh, uh, some of you may also know about the robotic bridge, which is being built. Um, it's already been built in the laboratory. It's being built in Amsterdam. And sometime this year, it will be there. These robots weld uh, on the ends of the structure, and the, the structure grows. And there is all sorts of other robotic structures being built. We've been building uh, concrete structures this sort of way for a long time. So again, um, what are we doing about it? Um, how does that affect the way we do things? So um, <clears throat> it's not just about digital design. These are, these are really interesting. I think I am really excited about this because I think you know, in, in not very long, we will be seeing some radically different ways in which we construct things. And we as an institution need to be absolutely alert to where we're going with that. Uh, and so for my little part this year, I shall be uh, looking forward to meeting members all over the, the world, actually, um, and, and asking, what are you doing? Uh, in this field. What can I learn that I can then pass on to others? Uh, because this is an exciting, a really exciting time to be uh, a built environment professional. And I use that term very advisedly because all of a sudden we're changing from being just structural engineers. We're, we're constructors. We're, we're designers and builders in the broadest sense. And that's, for me, is really exciting. So, um, <clears throat> where does that 
I don't really have a kind of um, sort of pithy um, closing statement uh, other than to sort of you know remind ourselves of, of, of where we've come from. You know that, that quality matters. Um, go for gold. You know we we need to do the very best we can. Uh, and and uh, I mentioned James Callahan earlier on. I'm going to for forgive me, James, for for embarrassing you, but a few months ago, James gave his Mill Medal lecture in, in this room, and, and he spoke brilliantly about those wonderful glass structures, and I've shown you a couple. Um, and, and it just struck me in my mind just now that actually that level of attention to detail that um, he spoke about, about a detail which was going to be hidden in the final structure, and the architect, I think it was Vinoli, wasn't it, um, said, uh, you know, I don't mind. I, it still needs to look good. <laughs> you know, it's no, there's no excuse. Um, so let's go for gold. Let's, let's do the very best we can. Um, and we need that, that, that lasting legacy because that's what people will remember us for. It really is what people will remember us for. Um, I spoke about precedent, appreciation, criticism, education. Let's do those things. And I'd love to be able to sort of try to put a bit more meat on those bones uh, during my year. Value versus risk. That collaborative design review, which I spoke about, I'd love to uh, think about how we can get the other built environment professionals, and I'd love to have some thoughts from you all um, and from my architect friends about how can we look at the way we do design rec procurement. You know, you all know you, 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 if you have a low cost, you buy something which is cheap, you know you probably get a cheap product. And the same goes for design services. Uh, we all know that. And I, I'm not here to sort of drag up that same old, old nutmeg, but... But, but the, pro the problem that I re referred to earlier on about the risks that we're opening ourselves up to by shortening the design times and, and cutting those corners that some are doing, uh, I think are very serious. Uh, so we mustn't have to forget those lessons of the past. We have wide responsibilities um, to all people, I think, all over the world. Um, I'm not suggesting we all go out immediately and, and, um, and put on our... Uh, Wellington boots and, and uh, you know go everywhere. But we, we've, we've got to keep it uh, under uh, you know sensible. Um, but we do all where we can have a duty to to help out. Um, but I think what I'm also really keen to do is to get us thinking more widely about the the built environment that we do live in. Walk around the city here. Walk around the place where you live, where you work, and ask yourself how could it be better? Or maybe isn't it wonderful? and look at the way that the engineers and the architects and the planners and everybody else work together to make that environment. And I'm so delighted that we're seeing more of that now. You're seeing more and more places where people have finally realized that those soulless streets where they're dominated by traffic, um, uh, are light, you know, without light and with lots of noise and all the rest of it, they're just places nobody wants to be in. And I'm glad, delighted that there's changes going on there. So let's engage in those issues. Um, and uh, digitally, uh, we're going to need to um, embrace those changes. Um, I'm getting to the point of my life where um, I'm not going to try and learn how to use Grasshopper. I've got some clever young people, and I can see one of them shaking his head saying, please don't. Um, so, so I'll leave it up to them, uh, thankfully. But we do need to understand what they're doing and where they're going. And again, what checks and balances do we need to bring in? I mentioned earlier on the whole thing about independent design checking. Uh, that was a thing about risk and how significant that is. How do we do that in a digital environment? You know, if we're not producing drawings, who's checking the design? That means somebody's got to go into the computer and check it on the screen. That's fine. We're doing that already. But we need checks and balances in place to make sure that the same <coughs> principles that we've grown up with and we've established because of hard-working precedents uh, and, and, and people who've gone before us, these people, those people who have established the right, safe way of doing stuff, we need to think how to continue to do that and make sure we have the same levels of safety in the new digital environment. I don't think we've got there yet. I don't think it's right yet. I'd love to hear from you if you think you've found the answer. And I've just written at the bottom there the need for CPD has never been greater. This institution has been in the vanguard of pressing for all our members to be doing continual professional development and demonstrating it. The need for that has never been greater. Like I say, I'm not going to learn how to use Grasshopper, but I am absolutely learning to know what it means. And I need to be taught. Thank you very much. Thank you.